do you want to talk about what happened on Thanksgiving? No, but I will. You don't want to talk about I it? I don't. Well, that's the end of the episode then. <laughs> I love you. See you, folks. I love you, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> um. So at midnight on Thanksgiving, we found ourselves in the ER. So there we were. <laughs> I specifically was in the ER. You were just there for support. I drove you there you when did I haven't me there. driven in months because we've yeah. been quarantining and being safe and all that. So I've just been letting you drive us yeah. to go get groceries. And so you couldn't drive. And so I had to drive. And then right. you mapped us directions down the curviest road, country road I've ever seen in my whole life in the dark. Well, in fairness, I thought that the hospital was on the other side of town from where we normally go. Yeah. So when it said, this is the fastest route, and that's the usually the way it takes us to go to the other side of town, yeah. I thought, okay, well, that's fine. We'll just have to do that because that's the fastest way to get there. And then later we found out it was just right by the Whole Foods where we go every week and uh, we could have gone the normal shopping route. Yeah. Sorry about that. So there I was about to go to bed yeah. and you went, I don't, I don't, I don't feel good. I don't feel right. Yeah. And I thought it was just because you, you know, you had a cup of tea and you were relaxing and then you got up suddenly. And I was like, well, you know, he has a history of panic. He has a history of anxiety. And maybe yeah. that tea just kind of, you know, kicked his heart rate up a little bit and made him feel weird. And then you went into the other room and then I heard, what the fuck? And I came into the room and I go, what? And you go, my Apple Watch is saying my heart rate is 170. Yeah. And I'm like, what? And we watched it as it bounced from 90 to 172, 89, 160. And I'm like, what is happening? And so I Google accelerated heart rate and it pops up AFib, go to the hospital. And we're like, um, okay. So yeah. I get dressed, but you are just moving around into different rooms and I can't keep track of you. So I get a little testy about it. Yeah. I get you into the car. And I haven't driven in months, so I'm trying to back out, <laughs> trying to back my car out of the driveway around your truck. Yeah. Can't do it. My windows are all iced up. And I'm like, F it. I'm going to go off road for a second. And I take my stupid mom van into the side yard and down through the, to get off, to get onto the road. And then I go through the curviest half an hour yeah. in the dark. Second only to going to Flagstaff from Cottonwood. Yeah. If you've ever uh, driven the quote unquote switchbacks, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's awful. After like an all day, you know, Thanksgiving cooking Which extravaganza. Which is already a pretty stressful right. day. I've yeah. been on my feet all damn day. I'm tired. And now we got to go to the ER. So they yeah. treat everyone in the ER like they have COVID. Yep. Thank you, science. And we, they get you back there. They hook you all up. And yes, your heart rate is 170. And then it goes down a little bit. And then it goes back up. And then it goes down. And then it goes back up. And it's all, it's more than 150. Yeah. The whole entire time. So they get you a wheelchair. And you're the kind of guy that, you know, you give people weird looks if they want to carry your bag or they want to like help you out to your car. You go, what? I'm capable. And the first thing out of your mouth is, do I really need a wheelchair? Yeah. And she goes, well, when you walk around, your heart rate goes up. We don't want that. So sit down. And so they get you all the way back into a trauma room. And all I can think about is terrifying things that have happened in that specific room. Yeah. And how many people have lost a battle in that room? It just freaked me out completely. And so we had to, we left the kids here to, we woke everybody up except for the little one. And we had them all just kind of hold vigil so that if she woke up, which she has been doing in the middle of the night now, yeah, um, she wouldn't be alone. And <sighs> so I was terrified. Yeah. Um, I've, I've spent a good portion of my adult life since we started having children thinking about death, thinking about how, when, why, just death, right? Mm -hmm. And leaving you guys behind. And one of my largest fears of that is passing away on a holiday. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. if you have loved ones, somebody passes away on a holiday, it kind of, for 
a period of time at least will ruin that holiday for those people who loved you. Right. Yeah. And so that's just, just, you know, when I go, I'd like it to be just on a normal day, not any day of consequence. Right. Cause I'd hate, I, I just, I can't bear the thought of like, Oh, I, I don't celebrate Christmas. That's when my dad died oh, or gosh. I don't celebrate Thanksgiving cause my dad passed away on Thanksgiving. <sighs> yeah. You know, that just kind of worries me a lot. And uh, so when, when I went into that, AFib event and we went there, I didn't think I was coming home. I didn't think I was gonna, I thought that was it for me. You know, when we were in the hospital, I started telling you like what to tell the kids and I gave you my one password password and. (laughs) Okay. So at like, I forget, it was around one o'clock ish, or maybe it was a little bit before one, they started an IV. Yeah. And you have never been in the hospital. No. You've never had an IV in your no. whole entire life. No. And yet here comes number one. Yeah. And they get it on the first try. They do a lung x-ray. They do blood work. And you do you do great because I'm holding your hand and I'm talking you through it the whole time and you do fine. So around one, the cardiologist comes in and he's asking you a bunch of questions and then order some medication. Yeah. So they get you on heparin, which is a blood thinner. Which, yeah. It's a blood thinner. And then shortly after that, wait, no, that was not the cardiologist. Or, or, he Again, was, that was sorry. He was an, guy. he was yeah. an attending yeah. uh, a doctor guy. Yeah. Okay. And then shortly after that, here comes IV number two mm. in the other arm. Yeah. And a nurse, Shailene, who she was a really sweet lady ultimately, but at the beginning of that, I was not happy because she hit a valve. And so in, my wrist, yeah. in your wrist. And so it blew right. It was, you know, she had to pull it out and then mm-hmm. blood went on the floor. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime you see blood on the floor, it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a huge, huge like shock and it's a wake up call and they have those specific floors where it's all white and you're just, you don't want to see someone that you love's blood on the floor. Yeah. I'm not happy about it, but she gave you pillows and she gave you a gown. And so she made me, made you more comfortable. And then she got the, uh, she got the IV ultimately in the back of my hand. Yeah. Yeah. So around 2 AM they got another medication I don't remember the name of that one, but uh, uh, the first like slowing of your heart rate medication, which yeah. you know, we were told later never works on anyone. Well, yeah, it doesn't work typically, but they have to start somewhere. Yeah. And that was supposed to help get me back into a sinus rhythm. Yeah, which is a normal rhythm. A nor- normal heart rhythm. Yeah. What was happening with me was an electrical issue where the upper chambers of my heart were fluttering Mm -hmm. and as opposed to beating in time with the lower chambers. And so that's why the heart rate monitoring was catching really high numbers and also really low numbers is because my heart was actually beating normally, Uh but the upper chambers were fluttering out of time. And and so the, the echocardiogram gets confused and it's counting the wrong peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then around 210, the insurance lady comes in. And I'm just, I don't know what to think at this point. I don't know exactly what's happening or why it's happening. And I'm really just really tired. And I haven't stayed up till two in like a while. Yeah. Around 3.30, I get a text message from one of our boys saying that our little one's awake at 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. So now I have that in my head that she's awake and wanting me and I'm not there, which is infuriating to me. I feel like, I feel like in a lot of ways, this whole event was harder on you than it was on me. No. Well, all I had to do was lay there and try not to die. You had to still try to manage, you know, your emotions, me, the kids, you had, you still like always had way more on your plate and you ain't getting paid. (laughs) And I'm so sorry for that. I'm really sorry that. I put myself into this position, mm. which we'll get into later. But so, so I'm there, I'm on the medicines. Eventually a cardiologist shows up and wakes me up. Just about every time I talked to a doctor while we we're there, it was after they've w- woken me up because I kept falling asleep. Mm-hmm. 
partly because I was tired because it was late in the evening. Yeah. But also partly because I have this kind of thing in my mind that if I fall asleep, maybe when I wake up, it'll be over or I'll waste some of the time that I would otherwise just sit there worrying myself into into a fit. Cardiologist came in and he was talking to me about things. I mentioned that I had just completed a seven day fast, water and tea, and that I was also now on an intermittent fasting schedule. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, okay. And I said, I think my potassium's low. My blood test came back with a low potassium, they said. Yeah. And he says, oh, you know, that's that's not, that's not probably not it. I'm going to get you on a different medicine, which would have been the third medicine that they'd given me to Mm -hmm. try to convert my rhythm and we'll see where we'll go from there. And so he leaves. He's also the one who told me that the first medicine usually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So he leaves and then Nathan, the nurse comes back and he puts me on potassium, not on a third medicine, but potassium, but potassium drip. I did get a third IV. <laughs> you Yes. I was going to say that before because you kept trying to talk me into going home. You're yeah. just like, babe, just go home. You need some rest. You need some rest. You need some rest. You need to go home. Well, I hung in there till 1225 p.m. the next day on Friday. Yeah, noon. Yeah. Um, because Friday afternoon, they got you another, a third IV. Yeah. So they could put you on uh, potassium. The the potassium, yeah, which and, burned. Yeah, which burned a lot going in. Yeah, it's very you know, it's a, it's a mineral, right? Yeah. And they're pumping that directly into your veins. It it hurt, but then they um, he had a little. The nurse had a little trick where he could dilute it with some saline so that it would still go in at the same rate of time, but it would not burn as yeah. much. And it didn't. Um, there were a couple of points where it would burn a little bit more than others. Yeah. But for the most part, it the saline mixture helped. So where did I go when the cardiologist came in to talk to you? Where was I? You were in the bathroom. Oh, sweet. Yeah. That was like two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't there for very long at all. And by the t- and then when I come back to you, then you tell me this happens. Yep. And then they come in with the third IV and yep. then a bag of potassium. Yep. And then you talked me into going home at like 1225. Yeah. A little bit after noon. And so I went home for a little while. Yeah. And while you were gone, they continued <sighs> me on the heparin, which was a blood thinner, on the amiodarone, which was amiodarone. the- Amy Oderon, yeah, sorry, which was the uh, medicine to try to convert my rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then the potassium drip. Mm -hmm. Well, the potassium drip completed, and then they gave me these two giant potassium pills. He handed me one and then started to go get water, and I said, just give me the other one. He's like, wait. Oh, I said, yeah, I'm one of those kind of people. (laughs) You can just swallow a few I can swallow any pill dry. And you don't need water to do it. No, not at all. It's Um, crazy. It's because when I was little, I had a really hard time swallowing pills. And so I just decided that's not going to be me. And so I trained (laughs) myself. Yeah. I can swallow a lot of big pills at once with no water. Liam's the same way because he had a hard time. And so I did the thing that you suggested was to put it in a little bit of jelly when he was Mm -hmm. little. Yeah. And now he can, now he can swallow his vitamins. Yeah. That's how they had to give it to me when I was little. I couldn't even swallow small aspirins. Yeah. They'd have to crush them up in jelly. Cause it's mind over matter at yeah. that point. Mm-hmm. But now I can swallow, you know, gigantic pills. Oh. <laughs> um, so he gave me those. And then as he was giving me those pills, he was like, okay, well, we're going to go see about the next medicine. And then he looks at the monitor and goes, oh, wait, you converted. It was just that quick. It was the potassium converted me back, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, because it, I, I just feel like it can't be a coincidence that as soon as the potassium, as soon as my potassium levels back up to normal range, mm-hmm. my heart goes back into rhythm. Yeah. I mean, we all know si- that's not how science works, but <laughs> so I go, I go back into the normal rhythm and then he's all, oh, you're going to text your wife and, and tell her. And at that point you were on your way back. And I was like, no, I'm just going to wait until she gets here just to make sure it's not a fluke and I don't jinx anything. Mm-hmm. I don't want to tell her, hey, I'm converted and then go back into it. Yeah. And he said, you, normally once you've converted, unless something major happens, you're not going to go back in. Yeah. But and you I, were raised with all these superstitions. <laughs> yeah, I was raised with a lot of superstition, right? <laughs> and so it's like, well, okay, I'm just going to wait till she gets back. And then you got back. It was so good to see you. 
Um, so, I really didn't think I'd ever see you again after I sent you okay, home. So that's what I'm. Um, the, but you the, came in the, and then I said, look at, look at the monitor, look at the okay. monitor. And you looked at me and you went, oh my God, you're back. You, you converted back. And I said, yeah, about an hour and a half ago. She said, why didn't you tell me? And I said, I didn't want to jinx it. First of all, you made me leave and I was. Yeah. It, well, I, I was, was worried going about on, our kids. I was going on complete like autopilot at that point. Yeah. I've been, I've had late nights. I've stayed up all night. I've, yeah. you know, being a mom and having babies and all that stuff does that to you. But I didn't know if I would see you again. And so I didn't want to leave and I didn't want to make that yeah. final walk to the car. And I was <laughs> his, hysterical once I got to the car. I needed a couple of minutes before I could drive at all. I just, I was really worried about you because you'd been up so long yeah. and I was really worried about the kids yeah. well, mentally I, and also physically because they'd also been up so long. And yeah. so I just wanted you guys to all just get some rest. Yeah. Well, I parked weird in the, in the driveway and then I walked in and everybody surrounded me and I gave everyone hugs and the older boys had everything everything figured out. They, they got everyone breakfast in the morning. They got everyone lunch. They, Freddie had been stay had stayed up yeah. since three thirty, but she was, she seemed fine. She was a little cranky, but I made sure everyone was kind of taken care of. I kind of packed a bag for you. And then, um, I tried to fall asleep, but you know, Fred didn't, <laughs> didn't want me to fall asleep. This is she something. just kept like, yeah. Sticking her face in my face and wanting to talk and cuddle yeah. and stuff. This is something that I feel very strongly about our family is that when that when that when it gets to the wire, when the shit hits the fan, mm. nobody fucking panics. Everybody goes, Okay, what can I do to help fix this situation? Yeah. And that's exactly what they did, right? Yeah, they weren't selfish kids at that point or teens or whatever. No. They were they just Figured it out. They just figured it out and they, they knew the plan. They knew what the usual schedule is and they kept everyone on it. Yeah. Um, and they got really it. proud of them. They got it all figured out and done. And Liam had food and water waiting for me and they, yeah. they took care of me as much as they were taking care of each other. Yeah. And they're good kids. You, d you said that maybe they were going to start you on a third medicine. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start heading back then because I don't want you to be by yourself for too, for too long. These, the yeah. kids seem to have it all figured out. They're doing great. So I'm going to come back. Yeah. And then I get to the, but, but were you also worried about a fourth IV? I, I just didn't want them to poke you anymore. Yeah. I'm like, please just stop poking the poor guy. Yeah. And cause that, the look on your face, when you looked at me, when, when he came in and said you needed a third IV was just really, really sad. Yeah. Like, please, please. Why? <laughs> cause well, at this me... time you've been poked four times, yeah. three successful, one unsuccessful. Yeah. That was enough, enough of it. Well, here's also the thing though, is like, it, it didn't really hurt physically. Mm -hmm. The getting the IVs as much as it just felt like more IVs means more serious. Right. And so the, the fear of, okay, I have to be hooked up to three different IVs at once. Right. That cannot be good was right. more distressing to me than, yeah. than the pain of getting the IV. Or, and nurses, or that. nurses are the backbones of hospitals. Absolutely. They get shit done. They yep. make it run amazingly well yep. but they're they don't really tell you everything they can right and that's disheartening because you had been told a couple of times oh we're gonna move you and put you in a room never happened well, we're gonna we're gonna well, do that this. turned out to be because i was something that i was somebody that needed to be monitored closely I know. and they were just they were kind of like without saying that kind of dragging it out waiting for me to convert before yeah. they moved me upstairs. Cause once I've converted, I only need a little bit of monitoring. I didn't yeah. need to be closely monitored like right. I, before. Right. So th they temperature test everyone at the door before you go in for yeah. COVID symptoms. Yeah. And then I had my mask on and she's all here, put this paper mask over that one right. and you can come in. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. So I get into your room I asked two other people how to get back to your room because I don't know. I'm not really good with like, there's like a million pathways. I can't figure it out. Yeah. 
So I finally get to you and I'm kind of huffy and puffy at that time. And you're like, but babe, do you want to know the good news? Look at the monitor. Yeah. And I'm like, oh no. So that, that was a, a nice, yeah. a lovely thing. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you, you big dumb, dumb, dumb. Yeah. I just didn't want to jinx that. It's, um, so I started to feel better after converting, like mentally better. Like, okay, I might survive this. Oh, boy. Right. And then, you know, you know, the nurses and, you know, even the cardiologist is like, you know, if, the, if you're going to have a heart thing, this is the one you want to have because mm -hmm. you and can that, live for your whole life without this ever occurring again. Yeah. And, and then it's it, treatable yeah. and people live their whole lives in AFib and yeah. I'm like, jeepers. Yeah. But I, I fortunately went back to sinus rhythm. So then they made me stay in the hospital overnight. Um, even though the cardiologist and his partner both cleared me. This is where I have to go home. Issues. They kept me because the attending doctor wanted to make sure that I just, you know, mm -hmm. observe me overnight and then see me in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't even, the next morning was Saturday. He didn't even come as his partner came. So, um, so and I, we had to make a big stink to get them to actually show up. Yeah. Um, and it turns out they'd put me on the same floor that they put COVID patients in isolation, but... It wasn't, the whole floor wasn't COVID. It was like clean rooms on one side, dirty rooms on the other side. And I was mm -hmm. in the clean rooms, but it still freaked me way out yeah. when I found that that piece of information out. Yeah. So I went home to spend the night here with the kids yeah. and cause I promised Freddie I would do that cause she was very upset that I got out of my bed. <laughs> yeah. And so the next morning I went cause Hopefully you were going to go home and stuff. And then when I got to the hospital, they said, what room number? And I gave them the room number and they said, oh, that that floor is not accepting visitors. Right. And I'm like, what in the hell? So I'm texting you. I'm calling the doctor. <laughs> He's like, well, these are logistical issues. Do you have any medical issues? I'm like, yeah. um, yes, a bunch. Well, I got up out of my bed and I went out to the nurse's station and I was like, I have to go home now. You guys put me on a COVID floor and I can't be here. I don't have COVID. I do not want to have COVID. And then, and the nurse said, oh, go back to your room and I'll send the charge nurse to you. Mm -hmm. And that took about 15 minutes. The charge nurse showed up and I was like, I was like, I have to go home. And if you guys don't get that going now, I'm going to just take these out myself, the IVs, mm -hmm. and I'm going to just leave. I'm going to walk out of here. Yeah. And I go, you put me on a COVID floor. She's like, no, 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 no. That's a big misunderstanding. Some rooms up here on the other side of this floor are dirty COVID rooms. But everybody on this side where you are, are non-COVID patients. And there are people in other rooms next to you that are having visitors right now. I can go get your wife. Mm-hmm. And then you showed up when she left to go get you, you showed up. So they must have let you back up. And then the doctor who was nowhere to be found mm -hmm. showed mysteriously up. Mysteriously appears. Mysteriously showed up, asked me a couple of questions, said he would get my prescription. Mm -hmm. And then the nurse came back in, helped get the IVs out mm -hmm. and sent us home. But then we had to wait for a wheelchair <laughs> to come. We had to wait 20 minutes for a wheelchair. Yeah. And the wheelchair lady came and she sent us and I felt really, really bad because she was a very small, petite woman <laughs> and I'm a big man. And she was, she was pushing me in that, in that wheelchair. And then we get down to the bottom floor where we get outside and you go, I'm going to go get the car. And you went to get the car. And then she just started talking to me about Jesus and the Lord and, and, and all of this stuff. And I, I was just really emotionally open right then. Mm -hmm. So I just took it. I just took all of it in and listened and, and heard her. And then we had to go immediately get prescriptions yeah, um, for a blood thinner and also for a beta blocker. And the beta blocker, for people who don't know, is a way to regulate your heart rate. Kind of gives your heart a break after having an event like that. Uh, although the cardiologist did say when I told him that what my heart rate was when I came in to the hospital, he's like, yeah, if you'd have stayed at that for like a month <laughs> and I was only in that rate for a couple of hours, but I thought that just that couple of hours was going to be a huge damage to my heart. But apparently you can go a, a long while like that, but you don't want to. Mm -hmm. 
So we go to get those medicines. And with our insurance discount, the beta blockers were $3 for a month's supply. But the blood thinner was $511 for a month's supply, which was still 80% off. 80% off the normal price. Well, at this point, when we leave this hospital, yeah. I'm ready to kick people just right. for anything. You blow, you know, yeah. you chew gum too loudly. I'm going to kick you in the throat. Yeah, you were like, done. I was, I, w- I had had my limit. But you have a long history with hospitals and being in them. And, and so the you, just, you, you have very little patience for, for a lot of the nonsense that goes on. It, you know, I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's not straight shooting. It's not telling you, you know, you had a nurse like this, but for the most part, the other nurses were just like, oh, well, anything can really like they were trying yeah. to placate you. But and, cover their own butts. And, yeah. Yes. Which I understand that they have to. Yeah, People absolutely. mean well. Yep. I understand that. Yep. Systems are broken. Systems are definitely broken. You stole my line. But... <laughs> People, people mean well, but the whole yeah. medical system is completely bass backwards and broken. And I, I don't know how I can fix it other than. Did you know in 1948 <sighs> that they determined that healthcare was a human right and that we just haven't done anything with that? We haven't done anything with that because it makes so much money. <laughs> that's okay. So that's my problem, yeah. right? Don't tell me you're going to move him into another room when you don't. Right. Don't tell me that any number of things or this could probably happen or this might happen. This could blah, blah, blah. No, just say he's doing fine right now. We're just monitoring him, hoping that he goes back into a normal rhythm with yeah. this medicine. Just be straight with me. Yeah. Most people probably can't under, can't take the being straight with. Right. And I, I know that it's hard for a nurse to like be one way with everyone and you know, they have to be tough and, and sturdy. And I get that Mm. and I'm grateful for it, but I just wanted to know exactly what was happening. Yeah. And then in the back of my head, I was just like, well, why you've never had any heart problems whatsoever. Your blood pressure has never been anything crazy. You're healthier now than you've ever been. My resting heart rate prior to this event was from 58 to 67 average. Right. So it's twice, more than twice that. Yeah. Not good. But why out of nowhere, all of a sudden, yeah. it had to be something. Something and then, triggered it. Yeah. And then when you yeah. said that you felt better, like half an hour after the potassium, I was like, well, that's, that's why you just went too long in a fast. And maybe, you know, something else is, is happening where. You're not breaking your fast in a, in a proper way or, right. you know, whatever. And so in the back of my mind, I was trying to figure out why. But to these people's faces, I wanted to know, is he going to be OK? Yeah. You know, they've only known you for a few hours. I've known you m- most of my life. Right. right. I can't I can't lose that. I don't want that to change. Yeah. Right. And so you drive home from a place like that and you just, you don't feel any better. You just have more stuff to carry around, you know, mentally. Yeah. And I haven't really like thought about it because I'm trying to take care of you. I'm trying to get back to a new normal Yeah. or whatever that means. And I think we figured out the why. So now I can really just pack it away for a minute so that I can concentrate on getting you better and getting you off these pills and making sure this never happens ever again. Helping me get back down to my healthy weight too. And that too. And I know that I don't make meals seasoned enough and and stuff like that, but that's not true. I know. And I know that you don't want me to like mom you or whatever, but that's like, that's like my, I feel like what we my have main going, mode right now. I feel like what we've have going since we came home. Doesn't feel like you're momming me. Doesn't feel like you're under seasoning foods. <laughs> it feels like you're giving me plenty of food to eat. Delicious varieties of food. Lots of veg, lots of just good stuff for my body. And I think, you know, the last time that I lost a lot of weight, uh, it was because you were directly helping me with my food consumption and preparation. So you're making sure that I wasn't getting too much of one thing. You're making sure I wasn't getting 
too many calories in a single meal. Mm -hmm. You're making sure that my meals are balanced and healthy, right? And you're doing that now because that's the best way for me as a food addict, Mm -hmm. as a person who can't control his own desires around food to get back down to a healthy weight. And then, you know, on top of that, we have the, we now have a schedule with medicine for me, which hopefully I won't have to be on for very long. But what we discovered after we got home was the, so during my fast, during my seven day fast, every day in the morning, I was drinking only water primarily through the fast, but every morning I would have a cup of tea called throat coat. Um, This tea is a medicinal tea and I was drinking it because I would wake up in the mornings with like an irritated throat, you know, from snoring or whatever but also because of allergies. And so, you know, I would drink that. It would help my throat and I'd feel better for the rest of the day. And I drank that every single day of my seven day fast. And then after the fast was over, I broke it on a Friday um, and I went directly into an 18 hours fast with a six hour eating window, intermittent fasting schedule. And during that six hours, I was eating one to two meals, you know, small calorie dense meals. Mm -hmm. But I was also drinking that tea. I drank 15 packages of that tea in two weeks. In two weeks? Yeah. yeah. While I I was fasting. Every day, right? Right. But also, you've been drinking it all year because... But I wasn't fasting. I was... Right. No, I know, but... Overeating. Right. So here's the key. Mm -hmm. I drink that tea literally minutes before I go into AFib on Thursday midnight. Mm Mm-hmm. I finish the cup of tea, I'm sitting there for a second, and then my heart rate starts to flutter and race. I go, oh, what's this? And I stand up thinking, oh, maybe it's, you know, maybe I'm just feeling gas or something. Mm -hmm. But no, it's not what it is. It's, I've gone into AFib. Mm -hmm. So when we get home, I'm like, I feel like that tea had something to do with it because as soon as my potassium, as soon as my potassium level normalized. I went back into sinus rhythm Mm -hmm. and uh, you went and got the box and you're like, holy shit. And on the side of the box, it says, do not drink this if you have low potassium. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got like a little cross on it, which is, and then you look into the ingredients list and it's licorice root. Yep. Licorice root saps potassium from your system. Mm -hmm. So when you're fasting, you're already losing potassium because your body's using it up, whatever your stores are. Right. But then the licorice root was taking more of that potassium than Mm -hmm. it normally would happen. And this is why I had headaches and muscle cramps all throughout the fast Mm -hmm. as well. And a normal range is like 4.1 to 5 point or 5.0. And you, when they did that first blood test were 2.9. Yeah. So it was really, really low. They kept saying extremely low. Yeah. So I was taking that tea and that tea was sapping even more of my potassium out. And I chalked those headaches and muscle cramps up to sugar withdrawal because Mm -hmm. prior to the fast, the part of the reason I decided to do the fast is Mm -hmm. I had been overindulging on chocolates and sweets and and cookies and stuff. So I figured, okay, I'm going to kick sugar with a fast. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's the best way to do it because you just get through it. And also fasting really works for you. It does. But typically um, in a long term fast, by the second or third day, headaches are gone. I feel great. Mm -hmm. But in this one, I just kept having headaches and cramps like I would laugh Mm -hmm. at a joke and my side would cramp up. But I just ignored it. Right. Because Mm -hmm. I'm an idiot. No, not an Um, idiot. Just you felt like you were doing the same thing that you did last time, which you weren't because there was tea involved now. This new tea. And not last time. Yep. And and so you didn't do it to yourself on purpose. You just did it to yourself unknowingly. Because I didn't read a package, which I normally do. Uh But I thought tea, oh, tea is safe. It's just dirty water. (laughs) But then I forgot the the vital difference is if it's a medicinal tea, Mm -hmm. like throat coat is, then there are other ingredients in there that could cause havoc on your system. Yeah. And I didn't think that through. Yeah. Here's something. I went into that hospital as one person. I came out of that hospital a completely different person in terms of like what I think is important. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I, I've i been a workaholic and a food addict for my entire adult life. 
and I've sacrificed relationships, friendships, relationships with my own children, with you, with my other family members, because I thought I'll have time. I'll have time to come back to that. And I don't. I don't have time for that. So I thought a lot about what's important. And I, I decided that the things that are important to me don't line up with the things I'm currently doing. So I'm making changes, right? I'm doing, I'm, I'm making changes in that regard. But I just, I don't want to be unhealthy anymore, right? And, and you know, like in the past, it's been really hard to get me to like take care of myself. Mm-hmm. But now I take a nap at lunch. Mm-hmm. I don't get a bowl of food and sit at my desk and still answer work questions. You ate pomegranate. I ate some pomegranate. You which ate I've some blueberries. Done. I ate some raw blueberries. And it's not that you won't eat those things ever. It's that I have to like, come on, come on, come on, come on. I have yeah. to talk you into it. Yeah. Now I just Hand give you some me. and you're like, oh, cool. And you just, yeah. because I, I want, well, I got to be here. I want to joke about it, but it's not funny. You know, it's my ship now. It's my turn to be the be the lead because I can't do it I'm supposed to have you know I'm supposed to have a a strong personality I know that um it's not always been accepted by other people um but you have never like dulled my light you know you've never made me feel any kind of like um I don't. You've never told me that I can't be something, or I shouldn't you can be something. Be anything you want to be. So, it's it's a little on the difficult, but this is my ship, and I'm gonna write it, and I'm gonna make it all better for everyone. I'm gonna steer us into you know calmer waters and help as much as I possibly can, and. I hope now you won't give me any, like, (laughs) I hope now you won't give me any crap about it. You know, I know this is not your fault and I know this isn't a dire thing. It is my fault though. I know probably long term it it is your fault, but not anything that you need to beat yourself up about. No. And I'm done with that. I'm done with, I'm done with just fucking around with it. I just want. This is it. This is the last chance that I have to make things right for me and my body and my mind. And you helping me is only a boon. And why would I, why would I take that for granted? Why would I take any of you guys for granted ever again or take my own life for granted ever again? I almost died. And I'm not ready for that. I've got a lot of things I still want to do. A lot. But my focus needs to be on me and my health and my family and not on working for somebody who doesn't give two shits about me, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just mean in general jobs. Like my direct boss gives two shits about me. He's a really kind person and one of the best bosses that I've ever had in my life. And I've had some, I've had some really great bosses. I've had some real shit bosses, but he's a really kind man. And I, I appreciate him very much, but I'm just talking generally speaking, like Mm -hmm. the larger corporation doesn't give two shits about me. Right. Mm. But my direct boss and my direct team care about me, you know, and I've got a couple of freelance side projects where the, the people running those projects really care about me. Yeah. Like I wrote to them and I said, here's what happened. I'm going to take the week Mm. off to like center and refocus myself. And each one of them wrote back and said, please do that. Yeah, We're interested in you long term, not short term. Don't stress yourself out. Don't give yourself more pain. And I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. But then I also discovered... Maybe mentoring is not something I, I want to do, mm-hmm. which kind of breaks my heart because I thought that that was something that mm. 
before this, that was very important to me, yeah. it was, but it was important to the wrong thing. It was important to my ego. It was important to my identity to my, of myself, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I share, I'm a sharer, I'm a mentor, I'm a coach, but none of that. I don't, I don't know. I'm still thinking that through, but I do know that I don't want to live the life I was living before. I want to live a life that is fulfilled and family focused because I really didn't think I was going to be able to see any of you again. That kills me. Yeah. Makes me really sad. All right. That's the whole story. <laughs> so we had a fun Thanksgiving. <laughs> As one does, yeah. you know. Do you have anything else you want to talk about about it or say? No, I don't. I don't. I, I don't want to stay in that feeling for very long. Me neither. It it's... was scary as hell. Don't want to do it again. Yeah. All right. Like I knew that I would kick some ass for my kids. I knew I would do that. I knew I could do that. But, you know, uh, now I'm, you're in that too. Like yeah. I, I'll, I'll punch and kick people. Yeah. I'd, I'll have my, you know monologue Grey's Anatomy moment you know what I mean for in, in a heartbeat yeah literally pun intended I feel very fortunate that I get to do this episode with you no <laughs> I thought we weren't going to be able to do anymore babe I just I like this no <laughs> this is something that's important to me yeah and I didn't I didn't like the idea of not being able to do another one well, I didn't want to think about stuff like that. And I, I wanted to just fix like, it. I just wanted to help fix it. And that's I'm what catastrophic I catastrophic thought, man. That's what I want to do now. I have those same thoughts, but I go, no. And I yeah. get out of it as quickly as I go into it. Because if I stay there, I won't leave. Yeah. So now I just need to fix it. What can I do right now to fix it? Yeah. You know, and that's asking you if you're okay a million times a day or putting all the love and power I can into good meals or bringing your medicine or, you know, making sure you have water or getting you up and walking and, yeah. you know, hugging you and, you know, telling you I love you a million times. I love you. Man, don't ever do that to me again, but I love you too. I promise. Okay. I love you. <laughs>